Crime One and Chaos contains adult language and graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. Every little thing is going to be all right, Chaos Kids. I'm Amber. And this is Allison. And this is Crime, Wine, and Chaos. Ba-dum-bum. Hello. <laughs> is it really going to be all right? Is it really? Every little thing is going to be all right. That's right. I'm pretty sure the intro a few weeks ago was we're on the highway to hell. So, you know, and now everything's (laughs) going to be all right. (laughs) Oh, good times ahead, huh? Yeah. So um, Naomi is still on her journey. So you are kind enough to, to fill in those shoes. Thank you so much for that. Man. Are you kidding me? It's like, hey, do you want to do this? I'm like, yes. <laughs> you know what? I, okay. me up. I so appreciate you. Also, so today and tomorrow, I'm at a conference in Seattle, like a tech conference. And I had so much. Okay, I've lived in Seattle my whole life. But for the listeners, I don't live in Seattle proper. I live in the suburbs. And going right. into the city is like still, even though I've been here my whole life, it's so nerve wracking. So I'm with all this anxiety this morning to drive into Seattle by myself. Meanwhile, Naomi's driving across the U.S. by herself. And I'm like, Amber, put pull up your britches and just. Hey, you know, I mean, I think you have legitimate um concerns there. I, I I'm still blown away that when we first moved here. I mean, because I pretty much grew up in Salt Lake City. And so for me, downtown was like, you know, Temple Square. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a pretty safe place to be. And so when we moved here to Seattle, I think I was under that same mindset. And I would drive into Seattle by myself, like all the time, and go to Larry's Club for the open mic, blues night, whatever have you. And I look back now going, (laughs) wow, Allison. (laughs) I mean, there were murders at that club. <laughs> I think it was closed down because of like mafia deals or something. I'm just <laughs> so... sometimes ignorance is bliss, right? <laughs> it really was. <laughs> oh my god. Oh uh, yeah. Well, I made I'm it. I'm proud of you. I'm proud thank of you. you. You did. Good job. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just drinking water this time because I just I can't even today. You know? Oh hey, I understand. I well, we already kind of covered beforehand. I'm drinking watermelon crush. I am so jealous. I think you should. It tastes like a jolly a watermelon jolly rancher, like mm. legitimate. But but wait for this, because I was kind of curious. What is your guess on the sugars? Oh, God. How many grams of sugar? <laughs> oh, God. Um, What's your daily intake supposed to be? Oh, fuck. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Whatever 10 times that is. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think if you're like diabetic, diabetic or something, it's supposed to be like 22 grams or something, I think, is your total daily intake. So, yeah, you're close. It's 74 grams of sugar. Oh, my God. (laughs) So you might be diabetic by the end of this episode. (laughs) Thoughts and prayers. (laughs) I'll be with that actor from Cocoon. (laughs) Fuck that bitch. Joining him on his commercials. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) From Cocoon. Wow. I don't wow. know what is what, re- what a reference. I know exactly who you're talking about. <laughs> okay, then that's good. That's good. Yep. I don't know anything else he was in either. Oh. <laughs> well, do you have anything yes. for the good of the order prior to me getting into this devastating case? No, no. I'm in I guess I could ask a question. Is this the one that that I sent you from TikTok, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. excited. I well, I shouldn't say excited. I don't know if that's but I'm anxious to hear to hear the got. full story. Yeah. So you may yeah. be aware of Nikki Wasilition on TikTok. Um, thank you for that. So I reached out to her and she was kind enough to share everything that she had regarding her mother's death. And Nikki is a fucking badass. 
Mm-hmm. She is as she is setting a new precedence for not taking no for for an answer from law enforcement. And I am impressed with That's, her. That is awesome. I know yeah. I saw like I deep dived into her page when I saw that to kind of get more. And yeah, I very much so picked up on like you were saying, she's she's on it. Every single post says I'm the daughter of a murdered woman. Like she is not yeah. relenting. So I am going to tell you about her mom, who was Stephanie Wasilishin. Um, And just at the top, I will say that uh, everyone is innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. And this is according to the case file that I read. This is my assessment. And that's all that this is. Okay. 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 (laughs) So (laughs) Nikki, our friend Nikki here was born in 1982 to mom, Stephanie, who was pretty young when she had her. And so Nikki's friends always thought of her mom as being the cool mom because she was young and hip and beautiful, which is like nice. That's always kind of a feather in your cap when other kids Mm -hmm. think your mom is the cool mom. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. In 1993, when Nikki was just 10 years old, she was sound asleep in her bed when her mom was shot and killed by her then boyfriend in the family home after an argument. Mm. But the boyfriend was never arrested and no charges were ever filed. Uh, Okay. Yes, please elaborate. I will. So Nikki remembers being awoken by officers around 2 a.m. when they came into her bedroom with flashlights. That sounds terrifying. Horrifying. Yeah. Mm hmm. She remembers being escorted out to the living room and seeing her mom's boyfriend, Russell Peterson, on the couch with blood on him. So I know she is then taken outside to the police car along with her little sister, who was three at the time. And she was the daughter of Stephanie and Russell. So Nikki's half sister. Okay. And this little three year old keeps saying, Poppy killed mommy. Oh, my God. It's so chilling. It's just so chilling. So the family was living in Sedona, Arizona. Um, They had relocated from Phoenix and they relocated when Stephanie and Russell were both offered positions to work at a new Italian restaurant where Russell would be the executive chef. Okay, nice. Italian. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, sure. My kind of jam. Yeah. (laughs) Pasta, noodles. (laughs) Yes. I mean, sauce. it's on <laughs> sauce. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the main, you don't just noodle it. You got to have some sauce on those noodles. It's true. It's true. We're not, we're not giving any high fives to Russell though. I mean, no, 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 no. no. I'm all for uh, only high five in the Italian part. Sure. 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 Part. So Sedona, have you ever been to Arizona? When I was very, very young. We went there. I think my dad had some kind of work thing. And I remember we stayed in this hotel and there were cockroaches. Oh. And and the pool, we were like, oh, let's go jump in the pool because it was so freaking hot. And the pool was like ice, ice cold, like vanilla ice cold. Ice, and ice we, baby. <laughs> exactly. We, when we got right back out of it. <laughs> oh. Okay. That's well, that's my memories of Arizona. Is it? Yeah. Well, that sounds lovely. Um, apparently, Sedona. I've never been, but Sedona is kind of uh, an upper middle class. It's beautiful, and yeah. so Stephanie, having come from a really difficult childhood, was really proud to be able to get a house in Sedona. Like this was nice. a big a big deal. This was a promotion. This was like. Moving on up. So she was even able to save money so that she could take her kids to Disneyland. That was what she intended. I know. But this new beginning was not working out the way that Stephanie hoped that it would. Russell was working a lot and wasn't home with the kids enough. And then he accepted a 10 day cooking school at Cornell in New York and was scheduled to leave on July 10th. Okay. So Russell had dipped into the Disneyland money to help pay for this trip. Oh, that's, yeah. Really made Stephanie mad. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I can imagine. Yeah. So two days before he was due to leave, so it's July 8th, Stephanie and Russell both work shifts at the restaurant. Coworkers said that Stephanie was clearly upset with Russell um, about the work trip, but she finishes her shift and she's home around 5 p.m. And Russell, on the other hand, is super excited about his trip. Obviously, doesn't really give a shit that his partner isn't okay with it. Um, And he gets home from work that night around 11 p.m. I know. I've got... I know I've got my own little opinions in here too, that they're just opinions, but we'll get to them. So, okay. Yeah. I was like, share. No, when we get there and I'm interested (laughs) to hear what you think. Okay. So The night Stephanie was killed, her and Russell were in another argument. Um, It sounds like they fought a lot. And according to people who knew Stephanie, she had, been the victim of domestic violence at the hands of Russell more than once. Um, Especially when Russell was drinking, which apparently he did a lot of. So Mm, on, on this evening, when Stephanie got home for the handful of hours where she was there without Russell, she made a few phone calls. She first called her sister, Wendy around seven o'clock And she talks to her sister about how frustrated she is with Russell for going on this trip and taking the Disneyland money. How can I ask how long were they? Do you know how long they were dating at this point? I don't, but at least three years because they have. I was just going to say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So she talks to sister Wendy. She's upset. He took the money, all the things. And then. She uh, calls Nikki's biological dad, which is her former partner, Craig Daly. She calls him on the phone and she talks to him for quite some time, like an hour and a half, which is unusual for them because they usually only talk to like discuss quick logistics with Nikki. But she Mm -hmm. was sounded like maybe confiding in him about her, what was going on with her and Russell, right? Yeah. Yeah. She told Craig that she was going to leave Russell in this conversation, according to him. And most people know that, you know, leaving is the most dangerous time for any woman in a domestic violence situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Yeah. But she's like, (sighs) it's time to go, right? So at this time, Craig and his girlfriend had recently separated, so he offers for Stephanie and Nikki to move in with him when she leaves Russell. Oh, okay. Yeah. It sounds like, again, I'm just, these are my opinions based on what what I heard. Like, like they really loved each other, but they were young and didn't know what they were doing, maybe, because they were so young, mm. you know? And then she yeah. gets with this Russell who is you know, um, makes a lot of money and he's kind of uh, like charming and handsome and all the things. And then he's a shithead. Right. So after talking to Craig, she calls her sister again and she didn't disclose her, you know, the full conversation to her sister that she had with Craig. But Wendy later reports that when she talked to Stephanie the second time that night, she seemed happier compared to her demeanor the first time they spoke. Okay, so she talked to her sister, and then she talked to her ex, and then she talked to her sister again. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I would imagine she seems happier because she's got a plan. Um, They spoke on this second call for about 35 minutes until roughly 11 o'clock, and then Russell gets home. So Nikki had been asleep for about 30 minutes by the time Russell got home. Mm-hmm. So this is where things start to get kind of f- fucked. So... It was Russell who called 911 around 1.45 a.m. So now it's July 9th. So, so he's that's home. like two, two hours mm-hmm. or two or three hours. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And his 911 call, he says, um, I need help. There's been a very bad accident. And he gives the address of the home and then he tells the dispatcher Uh, My wife and I were in an argument and she's hurt. She's hurt very bad. I need help. 
When the dispatcher asks what is wrong with her, Russell says she's been shot. And then the dispatcher asks who shot her. And he says, um, we were, I don't know. I might have, she might have shot herself. Just lots of ums and pauses. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, how do you, okay. I guess how do you going. not know? Right. I Right. Yeah. Or like she might have, I might have, unless like they were struggling for the gun or something and you don't know who who pulled the trigger or who, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Maybe, but. Okay. Well, we'll get to that. Okay. So, um, so he goes on to say that it looks like she was shot in the neck or the chest. So we. What? Okay. I guess I'm going to stop interrupting. I'll let you finish. You're fine. No, those. I was (laughs) like, as I was listening, as I was listening, I was like, but what? Like uncle Buck, (laughs) would you just let me. Uh, Yeah. So later on, when he's talking with an officer or another dispatcher, I'm not sure. Somebody else comes on the phone and they ask him if he did this. And he said, I didn't do the shooting. She shot at me. We had a little bit of an argument and it went kind of back and forth. It just kind of went off. He then goes on to say that he had one loaded gun in the house and she came into the bedroom and shot at him with the gun. Then there was a scuffle over the gun and it just went off. Okay. 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 Earlier in the call, the dispatcher asks if she's breathing or conscious and Russell says no, but that he doesn't know CPR. So he doesn't attempt to perform any CPR or ask the dispatcher to walk him through it. Nothing. That, oh, mm -mm. Isn't mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like isn't that what nine one one's for? Like to help you through that kind of stuff? Right. So then later on, when the dispatcher is trying to walk him through CPR, he, at one point he says, There's just too much stuff around. And the operator asks what he means, and is there something cutting off her mouth? If so, he needs to clear her airway. And shortly after this, the officers arrive and take over and the call is is done. So on the scene, officers find Russell still with the phone in his hand. He led the officers to his and Stephanie's bedroom where they found Stephanie on her back on the floor near the closet and the TV. She had a gunshot wound to her neck. She had no pulse. And uh, they also find the three-year-old in the couple's bedroom. (sighs) I know. These poor kids. Oh, that is like so horrible i wow was she uh, was she in there when he shot her there's some discrepancies i think about what she saw and what she didn't see but remember she was saying like poppy killed mommy so we'll we'll get to that and again this is difficult because the only witness is russell and his story changes a whole bunch and he's not being very clear about what happened. So, so officers then, you know, scour the house and that's when they find Nikki asleep in her room, which was in the lower level garage. Like it had been converted to the bedroom. So her bedroom was on the other side of the house. So she didn't wake up for any of this. She woke up when they came into her room with the flashlights. I can't even imagine. Uh huh. Then this, I can't, I couldn't believe. Nikki and her younger sister are taken outside and put into the patrol car, and then they bring Russell out and put him in the same car. What the f- first? Mm. Like what the? It... He uh, what what the what the actual fuck? He wasn't <laughs> detained as a suspect. Not only that, but, and I'm not saying that he did this, but that is a prime opportunity for him to put whatever he wants in those kids' head so yeah. that they will, you know. And at this point, Nikki still doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't know that her mom is dead. Russell's being weird and like, we're going to be okay. And I love you girls. And Nikki was like, he was never loving and fatherly to me. This was all very weird. It just, I mean, I feel like, like if a, a police officer, 
correct me if I'm wrong, if the police are called on a domestic violence, they wouldn't put like the abusive father in the car with the kids. Like you don't, or, I mean, this is much more, this is like potential homicide. Yeah. I mean, I think now I hope that that wouldn't happen. I mean, the laws stipulate that if a domestic Uh, violence call is made, someone is going to jail, but this is 1993. Not that that's an excuse. Um, the other thing that I had heard uh, Nikki say, I think, in one of her TikToks, and if I hope I'm saying this correctly, but at that, like, it had only been like for the last five years that Sedona had a police department. I think prior to that, it was probably overseen by the county. And so I think um, part of it was just not, I don't know that any of these officers had ever responded to a homicide before. Gotcha. Mm hmm. Or if they had, that probably hadn't been many. Right. Or whatever. But oh, goodness. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So they're in the car. <sighs> the kids, Nikki doesn't know what's going on. Um, and it wasn't until the following day that Nikki learned that her mom was dead. And it was Russell who told her that her mom was dead. And it was in the presence of the psychologist that I think law enforcement brought in. And she remembers her younger sister was just playing with blocks on the floor and was too young to even understand what was going on. Oh, my gosh. I mean, well, I, good that they had a psychologist there. Yeah, but. To help because, I mean, there's no, it's not going to make it better. It's a horrible, ugh. Like, he just was like, I, I can't, how, what did he, he just said your mom's dead. I, yeah, or did he I, say there was a fight or do, do you know what exactly? No, 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 oh, man. Okay. So apparently the night that the officers responded, they did talk to Russell in his living room while he was on the couch. And he says that he got home around 11 and learned that Stephanie had been on a lengthy phone call with her ex Craig. Okay. So again, I don't know how he knows this. There was another, um, I, f- I feel like it was maybe one of her TikTok videos where she suspects that perhaps he did like a star 69 or something. Um, but he said that the two got into an argument and they had both been drinking that night. And Russell repeatedly brings up this phone call between Stephanie and Craig. Like he's pissed about it, right? Did Stephanie tell him that she talked with him? I don't know. And nobody else knows. I feel like, okay, I feel my opinion is if you are a woman who is in a domestic violence situation and you are afraid and you have an escape plan, you certainly don't share that with the person Mm. you're trying to get. I mean, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, okay, so. But I. So this is according to him. Okay. He's saying that they got in in an argument about her phone call with Craig. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And Nikki speculates that perhaps he did a star 69 or looked through a call log or something. Um, Nikki said that also she was thinking that Russell might be pissed that Stephanie planned on taking the youngest daughter that they shared together and going and moving with both the kids to her ex-boyfriend's house. Mm. And that that would likely make Russell furious, right? Mm -hmm. But according to Russell, they got into a fight over this phone call and Stephanie went into the bedroom and got the gun. She came back out to the living room to tell him that she is going to blow his head off. He says that she then shoots at him and misses. So he gets off the couch and confronts her in the hallway. He then says that a shot went off in their bedroom, but he is pretty vague about how this happened in his first interview with police. He's just like a shot just went off in the bedroom. Well, I mean, okay. And I don't know, but she's like, he confronts her in the hallway, but then a shot goes off in the bedroom. But if she's in the hallway and he's in the hallway, I mean, I guess we'd have to know the house layout of how that all plays out. But 
Okay. But here's the other thing. Like, she was a very dedicated, loving mother. She's got two little kids asleep mm-hmm. in that house. She's going to pull out a gun and fire a gun in her home with her two children sleeping. Yeah, that doesn't do. Whose gun? It's Russell's gun. Of, oh, of course it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It gets worse. So. So at the station, both kids are interviewed. The youngest daughter says that she woke up to one shot, woke up and saw her dad kill her mom. She later said that she didn't actually see the shooting, but she's three. So, yeah. who, you know, um, she said she woke up when she heard a shot, got out of bed and went into her parents' room. And that is when she saw her mom on the floor bleeding and Russell was sitting on the bed. She then said that Russell told her he shot the gun. Nikki says she was asleep during the shooting and didn't see anything. Right. So yeah. both, both girls are placed in temporary foster care. Okay. Yeah. <sighs> Once the kids are settled, the police have a more in the depth, in depth interview with Russell at the station. And they have him start from the very beginning, which was that morning of July 8th, before they both went to work the whole day. Tell us what happened. Right. He said the couple got up around 1130 a.m., had coffee together. They both went to work, got there around noon. He said the workday was normal. He even um, said that like he was in a super good, good mood and Stephanie seemed like her usual self, right? But at one point, one of the coworkers, I believe her name was, was Kathy, said that she could visibly see that Stephanie was upset. And when she confided in Stephanie, she was upset about this trip. But she finished her shift. She left work around five and him at 11. So he goes on to say when he got home, he gave Stephanie a kiss and then got in the shower. He said when he got out of the shower, that's when they started talking in the living room and that she had told him about the phone call to Craig. Okay. Which I don't buy. It just doesn't sound to me like something that a woman who is trying to get away would do. That's my opinion. So anyway, Russell says that this isn't Mm. actually what caused the argument, but rather the discussion of him going to New York. He said he wasn't too alarmed um, by stephanie talking to craig i mean well but okay if they have a kid together so they probably talk right yeah i suppose but but if she yeah but if she goes in to tell him because if she's and i'm just all hypothetically over here but it's like if she's pissed at him for stealing that money Mm -hmm. and maybe it's a thing of like you know I was talking to Craig and he said, I could, you know, like you don't, I, you know, or I'm just done with you. You've done this. You're not thinking of me or, you know, I can't believe you did this and I'm, I'm done. And, and I, and he's like, oh yeah, where are you going to go? You know, kind of thing. And she could be like, well, Craig said that we, I could stay there with them, you know, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. I just throwing it back in his face. I mean, and again, I'm, that's all hypothetical. I, I, I'm just now hearing about these people. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, no, I'm, no. It's just. Yeah. I've been festering on it. Okay. So the rest of his account is what he had previously stated. Stephanie went into the bedroom, came back out with a gun and threatened him. He then says that he followed her back to the bedroom after she shot and missed. And then she tries to shoot him again. And so he grabbed her wrist. I'm sorry, but do you vague much? Like what? You're just having a conversation. She gets up, grabs a gun, comes back and, and shoots. I mean, mm-hmm. there's got to be more to it than th- that's that's as, that's the surface that they skimmed with this. Well, there there's more. OK, so he follows her. He grabs her by the wrist. He doesn't remember all the details, but he knows that the struggle ended when the gun went off and Stephanie dropped to the ground. He then huh, picked up the gun put it back in the holster and put it back in the closet on the shelf. Then he realized that he shouldn't have moved the gun. So he took it back out and put it back on the floor. Uh, My opinion of this is that the gun landed in such a way organically that his account wouldn't make sense. Yeah. 
So he's saying that he moved it. He's already fucked up the crime scene. And why, yeah. And why put it in a holster and up on the shelf? I mean, I could see like moving it if you're going to try to be giving her CPR or something like that, you know, Mm -hmm. but not like put it in the gun holster and put it back up on the shelf. Like uh, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. I think he was intentionally messing up evidence, but yeah. Um, He said that's when he saw his three-year-old daughter had gotten out of bed, but he doesn't go to her. Instead, he goes to the bathroom. Again, (laughs) my opinion. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Would be that he's got, yep. Gunshot residue on his hands and he's washing his hands. He says when he came out of the bathroom, he called 911. <sighs> okay. Still, we are not attempting any kind of aid. We are not like yeah. his first thought is move the gun and wash my hands. Yeah. Not tend to my what partner, the... tend to my daughter. Not freak the fuck out because she's shot and dead and die. I mean, right. Like if you're just like, hold on, let me go to the bathroom. Like what? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm. yep that's i didn't even think of it because that's one thing i was thinking is you know because he was saying he didn't know if he shot her or she shot and i was like you know the gun the residue or what, uh-huh. what is that called gunpowder residue yeah yeah gunpowder residue i was like oh did they test his hands you know oh we'll get but, to that mm-hmm. ooh, oh ooh, yeah okay Mofo Washington. Mm-hmm. He goes on to tell the investigators that him and Stephanie loved each other, that it was sometimes good and sometimes bad, just like all relationships can be. Um, he signs a consent for the police to search his house. He's taken back to his house to change and hand over his clothes to the police. Um, he's then taken back to the station. Um, in the house, they do find a bullet hole in the living room wall between the window and the front door. And they find a partial glass of beer and an empty glass of red wine on tables in the living room. In the trash is a wine bottle and some beer bottles. So whatever that's worth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stephanie at this time is still in the bedroom and next to her body above her right shoulder, they find the gun. There were four bullets still in the gun a bullet hole in the bedroom wall and bullet fragments on top of the TV and on the floor. Stephanie is in a nightshirt, which was torn in the front. She had red glasses on three yellow chains and a locket around her neck part. So I have a huge speculation about all this part of a gold chain was found under her arm and a smaller piece of that chain was found in the doorway to the bedroom. So it was broken by some, Okay, yeah. I mean, her shirt is ripped at the collar and her necklace is broken. My speculation is that he grabbed her. Yeah, absolutely. That she tried to walk off or run off when he threatened her and he grabbed her. Yeah. That's my opinion. <sighs> so the autopsy showed that a single bullet entered the left side of Stephanie's throat and that the muzzle of the gun was in contact with her neck when it was fired. mm Mm -hmm. Some of the forensics show that Stephanie had gunpowder residue on her left hand, but she was right handed. So, I mean, I think that if you put your hands up in a defense blocking position, you will likely get gunpowder on your hands. And also it was pushed against her neck. Right. So left hand, it was the left side of her neck, right? Yeah. So I see what you're saying. Yeah. If she's trying to push the gun away or, or get it mm-hmm. to move, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Or you said none, no gun residue on her, right? No. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. The medical examiner says that it was defensive positioning, likely meaning that her hand was up in defense, which is why there's residue. Um, she would not have been shooting the gun with her left hand because she's not left handed. Right. Her blood alcohol came back as 0.17, just over twice the legal limit. But initially, the medical examiner doesn't cite a manner of death. They leave that blank while investigation is still pending, which isn't uncommon. Okay. It's really hard to get that changed once the medical Mm. examiner makes a ruling. So you kind of want them to do that. But so detectives are speaking with a couple um, or a couple of the neighbors in the area. 
one of the neighbors mm-hmm. said that Stephanie and Russell were pretty quiet. Some people said they heard the couple fighting at night, maybe a few times, but nothing of note. There were no prior police reports of domestic violence. They speak to this coworker at the restaurant, um, Kathy, and she says that Stephanie would regularly push Russell's buttons, but Russell didn't give it any attention. Another coworker, Susie, says she never saw Russell get upset with Stephanie. And the owner says he never heard Russell say anything bad about Stephanie, but he did hear Stephanie speak up about how much time Russell spent at work. But all the coworkers agree that Stephanie seemed upset that day at work with Russell's upcoming trip. Again, I, this is my opinion. A lot Mm -hmm. of people who are abusive present themselves as very charming and very wonderful to everybody else. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I've experienced that behavior firsthand. Yes. And it is hard to maintain, uh, uh, to feign a sunshine shiny disposition when you are miserable. Absolutely. Yeah. That's just my opinion. So, um, so they speak to Russell's family who all say that he was a docile, nice guy who was just trying to advance in his career. But Stephanie's mom says that Stephanie had told her on about 50, 50 different occasions that Russell was physically and emotionally abusive. Oh my goodness. She also tells them that Russell called her the night that Stephanie died and told her that Stephanie shot herself. He doesn't say anything to Stephanie's mom about a struggle or an accident. He tells her that it was suicide. So he... he's just all over the place. Mm-hmm. They talk to Stephanie's sister, Wendy, who she spoke with that night. And Wendy says that she knows that Stephanie would not take her own life. She also said that Stephanie told her many times that Russell was abusive and that he would get drunk and urinate on the furniture. The fuck? Mm -hmm. (sighs) She also talks about the phone calls, the, the two phone calls that night and how unhappy she was. Stephanie had told Wendy that her and Russell hadn't had sex in seven months. She says when they spoke that second time, Stephanie seemed happier. They also speak to Stephanie's other sister, Kathleen, who also says that Stephanie had told her that Russell was abusive and she was unhappy, but she was conflicted about leaving because of the three-year-old that they had together. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Kathleen had been offered to help Stephanie to leave Russell. Stephanie's brother, Lance, also confirmed that she was not suicidal. And Stephanie had also told, told him that Russell was abusive. And unlike the sisters, Lance... Um, says that he witnessed Russell being abusive a few years prior when they were still in Phoenix. Lance was at their apartment one day when he saw Russell shove Stephanie and scream at her. Oh, shit. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. So then the police talked to Craig. This is Nikki's dad. Yeah. Craig says that Stephanie was strong willed and that he never heard her talk about suicide. They ask him about Stephanie and Russell's relationship, and he says that she did confide in him that Russell drank a lot and was abusive. He said that the call that night was about her issues with Russell, and they were like reminiscing on old times, which Hmm. is so sad to think like what might have been, you know. Mm -hmm. Ten-year-old Nikki is interviewed about her recollection of that night, and she says that Earlier in the night, her mom asked her and her sister to go to their rooms because she was on the phone making plans with Nikki's dad. And later that night, the three played hide and seek and watched TV together. And then Stephanie sent the girls to their room and later she kissed them goodnight. And she heard Russell get home about 15 minutes later and she went to sleep. So after all these interviews, they talked to Russell again and he changes his story again. Now he says that he isn't sure if there was a fight over the gun. He says he got home, took a shower, and then when he got out, they shared a bottle of wine. He says he might have gotten slightly impaired. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He says that Stephanie was telling him that she was going to go back to Craig and patch things up. And when the police ask Russell how he feels about this, he says that since he is the father of Nikki, it didn't really bother him. (laughs) This guy sucks. Oh, man. 
<sighs> sure. Yeah. He's Gandhi. He is pure <laughs> peace and love. <laughs> well, he then says that he didn't think that this meant a relationship with them, but more uh, a more cohesive co-parenting relationship. Like he wasn't threatened by Craig. They were just mm. patching up their friendship so that they can yes. co-parent. Yeah. He is, he is pure maturity and Zen mm -hmm. of the whole situation. Yep. Then he said, <sighs> it all happened so fast. The next thing I know, they were, they were in a heated conversation. I was just sitting there and she got up without saying anything and came back out with a gun and says, Russell, I'm going to shoot you. She shot the gun off once, recocked the gun, then turned around and went into the bedroom. Okay. He said he went into the bedroom and there may or may not have been a scuffle. Then the gun went off. <laughs> For those who cannot see the face, that sound. <laughs> mm -hmm. What the? I mean, it doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. She just gets up. They're just having a heated argument. She just gets up and it's like, comes out and like, I'm going to shoot you. Boom. I'm just, mm. mm -hmm. and there may or may not have been a struggle. Yeah. Like what? You know, if there's a scuffle. Yes. He said that is when his three-year-old daughter was, he saw her in the hallway and he says that she looked right at him and said, you killed mommy. <clears throat> And the detectives also note um, that at this time during the interview, Russell seems nervous. He also said that he heard the shot in the bedroom as he was walking through the doorway and he saw Stephanie drop and that he never had possession of the gun until he picked it up and put it back in the holster. So now he's not even anywhere near her. He's still in the doorway. And watches her shoot herself. Does he not hear the words that are coming out of his mouth? And like how much nonsense it is? Like makes. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Like you want to at least. I mean, if you're going to try to cover for his. Come up with something plausible. Or that makes somewhat of a s sense. This makes no sense. Yeah. Oh, I know. It doesn't is, make. Wait, his first story made sense. This makes no sense. Okay, that we know the gun was shot in the living room because there was a right. bullet hole. But again, right. that couldn't have been Stephanie either because there was no residue on her right hand and she's right handed and he washed his hands. I believe that he shot at her in the living room and she ran and he chased her into the bedroom and grabbed at her. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. See? What you say makes sense and follows the evidence. He's trying to continue to craft a story that will follow the evidence and it's not working, in my opinion. At all. I, I, I agree with your opinion. Okay. <sighs> okay. So his final mm -hmm. account, his final account was that he did not wrestle for the gun with Stephanie. Mm -hmm. And when the fatal shot was fired, he was standing in the doorway because he remembers seeing her fall. So because of all these conflicting statements, the police are requiring a reenactment and a polygraph, but Russell refuses to cooperate. So an officer stands in for Russell and a woman stands in as Stephanie. They want to know if this, any of these accounts is possible for Stephanie to pull the trigger with her left hand and have that bullet go in the same angle if there was no struggle and she was completely solo in this. like. She shot mm -hmm. with her left hand, Russell's in the doorway, she shot herself, right? And they learned yeah. that it was not possible for Stephanie to have been shot in that way without the involvement of someone else. So basically the trajectory of the bullet would not have been possible with her left hand. Okay, well, there you go. As soon as they determined this, they took the information to the medical examiner and Stephanie's manner of death was officially listed as a homicide. This was August of 1993. Okay. So after the autopsy, Russell is talked to again. He goes over the events again. And once again, his story changes. Fuck sakes. He says that Stephanie called him three times while he was at work that night, which was unusual. Russell says that Stephanie called Craig 
back around 1120, which Russell thought was strange. But according to Craig, he never received a call from Stephanie at that time. Did they check phone records? Yes. This is I one know of you're the, getting there. Yeah. This is one of the reasons why Nikki believes that he knew about her call to Craig by either star 69 or scrolling through a call log, calling that number back and then hanging up and realizing that it was Craig that she called and he was pissed. <sighs> so, okay. So now his story is that S- Stephanie called him three times while he was at work. And mm-hmm. then she called Craig twice. Mm-hmm. And then do people at his work corroborate this, her calling him three times? No. <laughs> Just on Fantasy Island. He then says that he came home with a bottle of wine, took a shower, and that he was excited because they were going to have a few glasses of wine together and then have sex. But as they are sitting on the couch having wine, Stephanie gets up and goes into the bedroom and comes out with a gun for no reason at all. What? And then she came out and said that she was going to kill him. And he was confused as to what was going on. He says that she pulled the trigger and he sort of flung back into the back of the couch thinking that he had been shot but he wasn't she then cocks the gun and goes into the bedroom what is it with him saying she cocks the gun and then goes into the bedroom like what is the significant that's one thing that stays the same and i'm just wondering why in his mind that's a significant like because if there's any kind of a struggle and the gun is already cocked and ready to go, it's more plausible that there could be an accidental firing. Oh, he's... Ew. Ew. Yeah. Uh, but now he's he's saying that he the, the gun went off and he flung onto the couch like he thought he had been shot. Like, that's a new detail. <laughs> okay. During this point, during this interview, he makes it a point to let the officers know that he can't forgive Stephanie for trying to kill him. Oh my God. This guy fucking sucks. Art. uh, How, how do you even, Mm -hmm. (laughs) when was this last interview done? Was this after the whole, they say it's a homicide now. Right, I'm actually, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So okay, and now he's turning her yeah. into the villain yes. of the whole story, mm-hmm. and himself into this big victim of like, oh mm-hmm. my gosh, and I can't forgive her for what she. Oh. Mm-hmm. Okay, so okay. she cocks the gun. She goes into the bedroom. He says he doesn't know what happened. Maybe it will come to him. Like it came to you like three times before her, but in different ways. Exactly. Mm-hmm. No, no, don't be mm-hmm. sorry. That's exactly right. <laughs> when officers ask him why he is saying that there wasn't a struggle, he says it was because he <sighs> saw her fall from a distance. So again, he's back to this. He said he watched as she went limp. Then he says that when she was falling, she hit her head on the TV knobs before falling on her back. He said that her hitting her head on the TV knobs turned the TV on. So this is all new information. Now she's turned the TV on. What the fuck? He said as soon as he saw her drop, he turned to get the phone. And that is when he saw the three-year-old in the hall. And she's like, you killed mommy. And he's like, hold on, pumpkin. I got to go to the bathroom Mm -hmm. and wash my hands. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, wait. He touched the gun first and, or, okay, sorry, I'm having a hard time to keeping track of Russell's We all are. Here. But remember too, <laughs> on the 911 call, he says that he may have shot her, but now he's saying that he saw her fall from a distance. So there definitely was a struggle. Mm-hmm. Definitely was a struggle. Mm-hmm. 100%. But he's trying to change that to be... Ugh, okay. Anyway, so the officers tell him that they did do the reenactment without him and his account of events wasn't possible. And they push him to explain how this happened and he isn't able to provide an explanation. They also ask him why he initially said that he would be cooperative in the reenactment and then wasn't. And he didn't have an explanation for that either. But this would be the last time that Russell would have a formal sit down with the investigators. 
In October, he does call the Sedona PD to provide his most recent phone number. They tell him that they want his July call log, and he does bring it um, down the following day. And in the call log, they find another inconsistency in this story, and they see in this log that the night Stephanie died, there was a call made at 1.36 a.m., approximately one minute before um, calling 911. And it was a call in to someone in Glendale, Glendale, Arizona, and it was later learned that Russell called his father before he called 911. <gasps> How long was the call? It was very short. Uh, it looks like, oh, it was a one minute call. And then he called 911 four minutes later. So maybe his dad didn't answer. I don't know. I never saw anything about if they talked to his dad. So then in late October, mm. detectives meet with the DA and they are told that at this time they need more information before they can file charges. They don't have enough evidence. What What are they needing? Well, they advise uh, the police to hire a psychologist to look at Russell's account of events to, you know, to provide an expert opinion. But there is no indication that this ever happened. There's a note in Stephanie's case file that the gun that was used be tested. But for some reason in November, that request was withdrawn with no explanation in the report as to why. And by the end of 93, the DA had decided that the case had insufficient evidence and they refused to file charges. So none of the follow-up things to provide additional evidence was done. That is such bullshit. I mean, if you've got signs of a struggle, if the freaking person... I mean, I guess I know in court, like I've, I've listened to your guys' podcast enough <laughs> where I realize, you know, like proof, you know, and there is circumstantial, but it's kind of like in this case, it just doesn't, the evidence that is there just says that he did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't even think it was a struggle. I think he attacked her. That's my opinion. Oh my gosh. So the girls were temporarily placed into foster care, but Nikki ended up going to stay with her dad, Craig, and her younger sister stayed with her dad, Russell. And other than a trip to Disneyland that their aunt took them on, which is so sweet, Aww. about a year after Stephanie's death, the sisters didn't have much of a relationship. And even though her younger sister had said many times on the night of Stephanie's murder that Poppy killed mommy, as she got older, she would completely change her story and say that mommy killed herself. And Russell kept uh -huh. his daughter away from anyone in Stephanie's family. And at this time, it sounds like her sister, who is Russell's daughter, they don't have a relationship. And she is, it, it sounds like very devoted and aligned with her dad. And her mom killed herself. Oh, wow. 25 years go by. It's 2020. Mm -hmm. After pouring over information, it is determined that detectives can't say for sure that Stephanie was murdered, but also the story isn't adding up. The reinvestigation does go get the attention of local media and it's covered on the Sedona news and investigators reach out to Russell and say that they would like to speak to him, but he refuses. Then the ball gets dropped on the case again, almost as quickly as it was reopened. So poor fucking Nikki is on this roller coaster of bullshit um, where she just goes from being hopeful that something is being done and then the ball gets dropped again. So she finally reaches out to the Sedona PD and they basically tell her that they aren't really doing anything with the case. Well, no shit, Sherlock. That's the reason why she's calling you. Yep. <laughs> so Nikki takes matters into her own hands. She requests the entire case file. That's the same file that she was gracious enough to share. Um, mm -hmm. And she just starts reaching out to other podcasts and media outlets and starts a TikTok account. And it doesn't take long for her to basically go viral. I will link her TikTok account in the show notes. Oh, also during her like investigation, she learns that her aunt Wendy and her grandma, Stephanie's mom, were suspicious of Russell from the very beginning and they kept their own notes. Ooh. 
fucking grandma for the win. Am I right? Fuck yeah. Yeah. Between her family's notes and the case file, Nikki also learns that Russell's hands were never tested for gunshot residue that night. <gasps> Shut the front door. Are you mm. kidding me? Mm-mm. Nope. She was what? even. Uh, no, I know. No, he was not treated like a suspect. He was fucking put in that car with those kids. Not detained. They collected his clothing later after they sent him on his way. I mean, there's so many things wrong with this. So not only that, but Nikki is able to get in touch with Russell's ex-wife, who um, he married right after Stephanie's death. Um, Uh And this is her little sister stepmom and she has since divorced Russell and she tells Nikki how horrible he was and that there were instances throughout their marriage when Russell would get drunk and confess to her things that happened that night. He tells her that he took a shower before he called 911 after Stephanie was shot before 911 was called and that he also started a load of laundry before calling 911. Nikki goes to the police with this information and they tell her that it is hearsay. Mm. So obviously this case is fucked, but over the years, Russell has been highlighted and celebrated in Sedona for his work as a chef. He is considered a prominent member of the community. So that might have that just, I can't imagine. I just, mm. Nikki has asked for the FBI to get involved, but the Sedona police have declined assistance Mm. so nikki has started a petition demanding a proper homicide investigation which will also be linked in the show notes i signed it on behalf of crime wine and chaos and made a donation if you can afford a donation please do so but please sign the petition check out nikki's tiktok page if anyone has any information about the death of stephanie they are asked to call the sedona pd at 928-282-3100 and that wow. is the fucking botched investigation of Stephanie Wasilishin's death. Ugh. I cannot believe they, what, I mean, were these detectives like right out of training school, of preschool detective school? Like, how do you not test his, especially if he's like, I don't know if I shot her or she, I mean, like, what the actual fuck? I don't know. I and really his don't. clothing? Mm-hmm. They, like, sent him home and said, oh, can you just give us your clothes when you have a chance? And he was wearing dirt <laughs> of the, are you, what? <laughs> I mean, I, I, there's so many things wrong with this. There, there's. I I don't even know where to begin. I think that there might be some serious patriarchy happening here. I think that it wasn't uncommon for domestic violence cases to be completely fucking ignored. Um, Oh my God. You know, and so, cause you sent me, mm -hmm. you know, the stuff, right. Mm -hmm. And reading, and that's one of the things that I kind of picked, you know, like, Hey, we're not arresting you. We're not doing this. We just want mm-hmm. the truth. Just tell us what your what's up, you know? Mm-hmm. And you, I mean, that to me is like, ugh. and the fact that he was so vague with what their conversation was. Right. And was just like, she got up, she went in the room, she came back and was like, I'm going to shoot you. Then what? I mean, it was just like, mm-hmm. And he's like, this is so unreal. Why isn't this? I can't believe this is happening. Yeah. There were other people like uh, in one of the podcasts that I listened to. I think it was the, um, oh, God, this great podcast. I think Voices for Justice where Stephanie's friends had talked about she never shot a gun in her life. Like she was not down with that at all. Yeah. Yeah. Like, she didn't mind that other people were into it, but it was like a hard pass for her. So, yeah, this just doesn't, none of it makes sense. No, none of it makes not sense. at all. Yeah, I really hope they reopen this investigation. I think that the fact that there's evidence that the gun was pressed against her neck and that the trajectory yeah. of the bullet could not have gone that way 
if she was the one pulling the trigger. That, to me, is enough evidence. Yeah. Well, and there, too, I remember reading something. They measured her arms. Yeah. Like, they measured the length of her arms to see if it would work. And it wouldn't even work because of the length of her mm-hmm. arms. Mm-hmm. Ugh. Yeah. This, I I feel so, eh, I'm going to get emotional. So sorry, mm-hmm. Nikki, because, and your family, because that is one of the most horrible feelings to feel so completely like helpless Mm -hmm. to do anything you know it's like the people that we're told are there to help in these situations to make it right Mm -hmm. and when they fail oh yeah but you know it's not there have been cases where enough people put the pressure on and you know if it takes whatever the police department feeling some type of way about the negative exposure then however we need to get there but just keep sharing nikki's tiktok and if you have a podcast fucking cover the story just keep keep covering it because and sign the petition sign the petition yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we should all be uh, lucky to have a Nikki in our life, you know? Yes. That cannot be easy. Absolutely not. And I just hope, yeah, I hope it turns out. I do too. I'll keep an eye. Oh, thank Thanks you, for making me aware of her. Absolutely. Yeah, she's a badass though. She is. Yeah. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for, and then inviting me to be a part of it. Heck I love yes, it. sister. Um, do you have anything else for the good of the order? You know, I just, you know, follow these ladies on all of the things (laughs) and they're on the TikTok and the, well, maybe not so much TikTok. (laughs) Oh God. My TikTok account is on life support. I'll get there. You guys, I, there's so many things. There's so many things. It's flatlining. If you want (laughs) to, if you want to become a Patreon, become a Patreon. I am a proud, proud Patreon member and I enjoy listening to all of these ladies bonus materials. They never fail to crack me up at least once, if not twice per episode. Um, Even if it's dark material, they somehow manage to, you know, get a laugh out of you. So it's highly worth that $5 a month. And um, so, yeah. Did I do okay with that? Fuck yeah. (laughs) So cute. You did so good. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Sister, this was so, I love you. I love you so much. This was so. Love you so much. Fucking chaotic. I was way up on that. Do it. Chaotic. (laughs) Wow. Nailed it. (laughs) (laughs) Love you. Love you. Bye. (laughs) Bye. Crime, Wine, and Chaos is produced by 8th Direction Records. Artwork by Joshua M. Davis. Music by Paul Abner. If you would like to support the show, you can visit our Patreon page at Crime, Wine, and Chaos forward slash Patreon. Cheers! Quacks like a duck and smells like a duck and... (laughs) I don't think you're supposed to sniff ducks.